Hello, I'm Steve Maskery and welcome to Workshop Essentials. A year or two back, I developed and published a design for a mitre jig for the table saw for making the sort of mitres that you get with a picture frame. And it's that that's hanging on the wall up there. And there's a YouTube video about that if you want it. But not all mitres are cut in that orientation. I'm currently making a box and these mitres go vertically so they're not cut across 45 degrees like that they're cut 45 degrees like that and we need a different method of cutting them if we want to do it accurately so I've got a jig it's very simple just a piece of MDF I wish I'd made it a little bit longer if I'm honest um, a couple of foot would have been a more sensible size runner on the bottom and it's first mounted so that this edge of the board is slightly beyond the saw blade. And so then I run it through the saw and I, that gives me a true edge that's zero clearance to the blade, dead, dead square. Now once upon a time I would just have screwed some T-Track to this back edge and used that. But T-Track has got very expensive. The last time I bought some, which was three or four years ago, I guess, it was $29.95 for four lengths that were four foot long. The same company, Rutland's, is now selling pieces that are only a metre long, not 1.2, but 1.0, and there's only two of them in a pack, and it's still $24.95. It means the price has actually doubled in, a, in just a very few short years. I do not understand why, that is not normal inflation. And because this is a jig that I'm not going to use very often, um, I'd rather save it for something, for something better, quite frankly. So my fence is a homemade uh, T-Track. It's just a piece of uh, pine scrap, and I routed a groove down the middle on my router table using the drop-on method. And there is a video on YouTube showing you how to do that. I then turned it over and routed a groove all the way along the underside so that a flange nut or a turret nut like this can slide in it. And then I routed an access hole at the end so that I could feed this in from the end. Now because I'd got one dead straight accurate edge on my baseboard, I could use that to set this fence square to it. And then when this is screwed down, I can still get my turret nut in there because of the access hole in the end. Like that. And then I've got a very simple stop block and a Bristol lever. And that goes into there like that. And so that slides nicely along there and can be stopped anywhere I like. And then the workpiece can go on my jig, a stop up to it and make the cut when the blade is tilted to 45 degrees. I'll do that in a minute. I want to show you something else first. When it comes to gluing the mitres together, you have to give it a helping hand really. Glue joints that are face grain to face grain are very strong indeed and usually the joint is stronger than the wood itself. When you try to take it apart you're more likely to split the wood than you are to uh, make the joint fail. But if you do end grain to end grain it's a different matter altogether. That's very weak because the end fibres of the wood are little tubes and there isn't actually a lot of solid surface area. So if you glue end grain to end grain it's not going to resist uh, forces anywhere near as well. And a mitre joint is halfway between the two. It's sort of 50% between fully face grain and fully end grain. So better than a butt joint, not so good as a face-to-face -face joint. 
So we usually put splines in there and we can either put them across the joints and I'll do another video showing you how I do that or we can put the spline inside the joint and that way as well as adding strength it also aids alignment when the box is being put together. So I have a, a jig for that and it consists of a baseboard and a 45 degree uh, face and then a fence on the back. And to do this, I started off with a piece of MDF that was about this big, actually. It, this and this were part of the same piece. And I started off like that so that I could route two grooves. In fact, I did them on my dado set. I don't often use my dado set on the table saw, but I did for this. Uh, two grooves to take uh, a pair of braces, brackets, fillets, whatever you want to call them. And that way, I know that this groove and this groove will line up exactly and I've not got to sort of force things together they just go together beautifully because they were originally part of the same groove and when I glued it together I didn't try to glue all these four pieces together at the same time I glued the um, fillets in first and then only when I'd got them right and they'd gone off a bit did I glue this in place uh, and it saves having to try and clamp multiple pieces together at any one time this runs with the fence on the left hand side of the blade. So my fence goes over here for this job and something like that. And I've got a very slight gap, three millimeters or so, between the edge of the jig and the saw blade. And that's important because when we put the, the uh, uh, spline internally, I don't want to be right on the inside edge of the corner, but I do want it to be closer to the inside edge than the outside edge. If I get very close to the uh, sharp corner of the joint, I run the risk of coming out on the face of my box and that would really spoil my day. So uh, about three, millis, three or four millimeters is ample for most kinds of boxes. And then you can work out how deep you need to go and set the blade height accordingly. And so if I've got a workpiece, this is a, just a, a box that I had a little accident with, uh, that would go in there like that. Clamped in place like that. And then just run over the saw blade. And that will give me a groove in the mitre into which I can fit a fillet. So how does this lot work in practice? Well, let's just do... A little bit of a demo shall we I'll just get set up and I'll see you in a moment right well I've got myself set up with my jig my workpiece so the bottom edge of this goes very slightly over the top edge of the jig see what I'm doing that's better about like that and the stop goes up to it like so and I've put in a zero clearance throat pit plate that's been cut at 45 degrees so that when I raise my blade, you don't actually need a zero clearance throat plate for this, but uh, it's what I've got for 45 degrees. And I need to raise that so that it clears, just clears the top surface like that. Okay. Now you'll notice I've got no guard on this. Um, the super guard that I usually have here is usually supported by my fence. And although I have got a bracket support for it, it actually makes it difficult to, for you to see. So I'd rather not use it for this. Instead, uh, because I don't use a, I never use my saw unguarded, I've got a standalone guard like this. How much clearance have I got there? Enough, that's right. Which just means that I'm going to touch that before I get anywhere near the blade. And that will... Uh, it also stops anything flying up off the top. So I think we're just about ready. Stop is set, workpiece is right, guarded, blade set at the right angle. I need some ears.
Now, I don't know if you noticed, but when I turned my workpiece down around, I didn't just push it up against the stop like that. I push it up against the stop like that and lowered it into place. And that's because if I pushed it in like that, there's a very small chance that the very end will go underneath my block. And I don't want that. I want it to go up to the block. I don't want it to creep underneath it. So those are my two long sides sorted. So all we do for the short sides, of course, is reset the stop. And you could see there, actually, just how it, what important it is not to let this uh, waste and scrap pile up on your table saw. It's very easy for it to get kicked back. And so now I've got the four sides of my box. They are pretty darned exactly the same length. And this pair is also the same length. I would actually shoot these on a, on a shooting board because that's the way I am. But for something that's very fairly crude, say something for the workshop, just to keep a set of tools in or something, you wouldn't even need to do that. What we do need is something to strengthen that joint. So the next job is to get the other jig set up correctly. See you in a moment. So this is my long spline jig. Now I originally built this with this fence along that edge for it to run with the fence on this side, like that. <laughs> and I have no idea why I did that. <laughs> I have no idea why I designed it to run left-handed. I must have been thinking something at the time, but I don't know what the reason was. So I've just moved it from this end to, to this end so that it can run more conventionally with my fence on the right-hand side. The edge of the jig here acts as a very good indicator as to how far in my spline is going to go from the inside corner, where is it? From the inside corner of my workpiece. I don't want to get it too close to this edge because then I won't be able to go very deep before I come out on the far side and that will really spoil my day. But on the other hand, I don't want to get it so close to the inside that I run the risk of spoiling that internal corner. So I want it to be, let's say, for argument's sake, three or four millimetres away from the inside edge. And that will enable me to go in quite a decent way uh, to give me you know, good uh, strengthening of my joint. And I can see how much it is going to be in from that edge by looking at the difference between the gap in my throat plate and the edge of the jig. So that's about right. So... I've set the height to about 10 millimetres. It doesn't matter so long as they're all the same. And I need, where's, where have I put my guard? My guard goes over here. Now, one of the nice things about this jig, one of the nice things about this jig is that the workpieces register themselves automatically because they simply go down as far as the table and then they're in the right place. Like that. And it doesn't matter whether it's a short one or the long one, it's always the bottom uh, edge, the mitre itself, that's registering against the table. So I think we are ready to go.
And there, I've got two very nice grooves for my spline. And I've just got to do that on all the other pieces. When you've cut your spline material, and I will show you how to do that in the next video, you can, if you want, just put it into the slot like that. But it's not the best way of doing it because the grain is running this way and it's easy for that to snap and then your joint will come apart. And the whole point is to add strength to the joint. So it's a much better idea to cut this into short pieces and install them crossways like that. And then you've got the length of the spline going across the joint and it's a much stronger way of doing it. Just make sure that you install it with a little bit of an overhang at the bottom to clean off a little bit of overhang at the top to clean off and if you know where you're going to separate the lid make sure that you've not got two pieces of spline material right next to each other exactly on that on that uh, joint you want to be able to cut through a spline to give a very clean appearance when the box is opened up so when it's all glued together it's it'll look like this Now my friend Bob has suggested that it might be better to have the mitre cutting jig on the left hand side of the saw blade rather than the right hand side. And you know what? I think he might be right. So I've moved the runner from over here to over here, being careful to keep it square to this fence and then run it through the blade. So I've now got a zero clearance edge on this side of the jig rather than that side. I can think of three advantages. The first is, do you remember me saying I had to put that up against the stop and then drop it down so that it didn't accidentally get caught underneath the stop? Well, if you do it this way up, that doesn't become a problem because you're putting the edge up against the block and provide the block is higher than the thickness of my workpiece, it will always be pushing against something that's firm. So that's one advantage. The second advantage is that any offcut is going to fall away from the blade. Now, if you remember back earlier on in the, in the film with the close-up, at the end of the cut, one of those bits of offcut that was sitting on the blade got flicked back. And uh, I don't like things being flicked back at me, not even a little bit. So this way, the offcut is going to fall away from the blade and there's no chance then of, uh, of it getting uh, kicked back at me. So that's the second advantage. And the third advantage is that I can use my suva guard again. Now, if I'm working over here, the, the fence has to be out of the way. And the fence supports my suva guard. And when it's over that far over on the right, my suva guard can waggle about far too much for my liking. But with, with working over here, it means I can bring the fence back over here, that offers support to my suva guard and now there's hardly any movement. So that can come over here. I can use the jig. I'm fully protected from the blade I'm a, and I'm a much happier woodworker. So let's see what happens when we do a cut, shall we? Look at that. Clean as a whistle. I thought there might be the risk of breakout on the inside, but in fact, that is perfectly clean. That's great. Very happy with that. And um, of course, even better guarding than with the magnetic one. And the waste has fallen away from the blade. There is no chance of that blade making contact with this and throwing it back at me. So I think that's a, what they call a win-win-win situation. Thank you very much indeed, Bob. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe and tell everybody else about it. It's the only way it gets seen. So thank you very much for watching. And until the next time, enjoy your workshop. Cheerio.